Uprose is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. It's an intergenerational women of color-led organization dedicated to environmental and social justice. Our community really determines what the priorities are. I feel like what always has to be the main priority is climate change and how we continue to move with climate change because it's not something that's coming. It's not something that's around the corner. It's something that's already here. It's something that we're living with, that we're living through. And we want to prepare the community and prepare all communities for it. Because if we don't prepare, we know no one else will prepare. Communities of colors are affected um, worse because we're at the front lines of the crisis and we're kind of pushed to the side because at the end of the day, no one really cares what happens to us. Sunset Park is one of the last working industrial waterfronts in New York. And we still have a lot of industry jobs here now. Instead of having things that are regenerative, that are self-sufficient, that take care of themselves and that benefit the community and benefit the people in the community. We have things that are making our kids sick, are costly, that we have to pay for. It's where you put all your nastiest businesses, your immigrants, like every, anything as a society you didn't want to deal with ended up on the waterfront. This whole notion of luxury uses on the waterfront is a relatively recent phenomenon in urban history. We don't have the luxury to choose between fighting against racial profiling and police misconduct and climate change. We live in that nexus of all those isms. And so for us, it's a climate justice movement. People act like environmental justice is a new thing. I always say that it started within the slave quarters. It started in the slave quarters when people of African ancestry had the worst food, the worst health care, were given the worst lands, and were already being subjected to all of the contamination that would benefit the more privileged communities in the United States. Young people who are going to be the ones dealing with this crisis, we need we need them to be at the front. We need them to be learning the skills from now. How to do direct action, how to plan, how to organize. Our young people came in and said, what about this power plant? We gotta stop it. And I was like, really? Nobody's been able to do that in New York. And he's like, okay, so we'll train you. They fought for three years, like the average age was 15 years old, and they stopped the siding of a power plant that would have been the size of three football fields. We've also brought in a lot of environmental amenities so that people can live healthier lives. We've doubled the amount of open space. One third of our community is under the age of 19, and there was less than a quarter acre of open space for every 1,000 people living in the community, and our community has 130,000 people. When the elders came to us and said, they've taken away our bus, we need you to get it back for us. We trained them how to testify at hearings, how to put together talking points. They got themselves the bus back. A lot of people were complaining about the meridian in the middle of 4th Avenue. A lot of people were getting hurt by cars, so they came to us and said, hey, um, we need to make it bigger. So we were able to expand the median so that when people are crossing the streets, there's no accidents. The New York City Environmental Justice Alliance is a citywide coalition of community-based organizations from the city's most environmentally overburdened communities, essentially the city's low-income communities and communities of color. These communities, you know, a lot of them have had successful track records at stopping waste transfer stations, sewage plants, incinerators, but the underlying structural reasons that keep rising to these repeated sightings were larger systemic problems embedded in law that have disparity and outright racism cooked into them, right? Solid waste, for example. There are three communities in New York, the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, that handles something like 75% of the entire city's solid waste stream. And New York produces a staggering amount of waste, something like 12,000 tons per day of residential waste. About 26,000 tons per day of commercial waste. Construction and demolition debris, uh, fill material, putrescible material from the restaurants and businesses and office buildings. There's something like 200 carters in the city with a truck fleet of something like 2,000 trucks, really polluting trucks. Each business in New York will contract with a specific hauler, which leads to a Wild West cowboy system where you can have on the same block three different Starbucks stores picked up with three different garbage trucks. You have workers, immigrants who may be undocumented, or folks who are formerly incarcerated that are being exploited by a largely ununionized dangerous industry, which the city 
barely regulates. And there have been a rash of civilian deaths. Our 20 year campaign has been trying to shift New York City's waste export from a truck base to a marine and rail base system. Each barge of marine transfer station waste will remove something like 40 18 wheel tractor trailer trucks. But even that isn't enough, right? We just generate too much waste. People of color and low income folks from these communities a few years ago started working directly with organized labor and some of the mainstream environmental groups. We finally got New York City's mayor de Blasio to embrace a zero waste goal for New York. First time any mayor has done that. Sunset Park is changing very rapidly, faster than we can keep up with it. We have places like Industry City who their main goal is to push us out. What we now have is a $24 cup of coffee, avocado sandwiches. We've got these two Italians who apparently went to Mexico and discovered avocados in a community that is largely Caribbean and Mexican, uh, where we eat avocados, right? That way of thinking of appropriating our culture, selling it back to us, creating spaces for recreation and for privilege when there are so many in New York, for commercial businesses when there are so many in New York and the city not thinking, we've got an industrial sector. We need blue collar jobs and we need to address climate change. You're seeing a big exodus of African Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans are now moving out, Dominicans are moving out. I'm displaced from Sunset Park. I don't live here anymore. I live in Staten Island apparently. We have kids in my house, my little cousin, my brothers, and having to take care of them and work even more hours is not it's not wasn't going to work. I miss it here. All my friends, we all lived on one block. So it felt really good. Where I live now, the people I live around support Donald Trump. I want to come back and live where my people are. The automobile shops, they're losing money and they can no longer support themselves. What happens when you start gentrifying a community is that you bring in people uh, with a higher income who no longer want to have a block party, who want more policing. In Santa Park, you have street parties, you have black parties that go on and on and on, and the whole community is there. And these people, they're not used to it. They're not used to that sense of community. There's kids that come from down the block and they'll just run in because they know this is a place where they can just hang out. Like they, This is a place that they're safe. The community needs places like this. Now these people have to be protected. They don't want to hear uh, loud music, and so they will call the police on us. Uprose was originally started as a result of Latinos fighting against police brutality. You need to make sure that you know how to talk to them, how to respond to them. You need to know what you can say and what you can't say, your rights, and what is your right, but they won't tell you is your right. people don't realize was a working class blue collar community not that long ago. It was when they rezoned Williamsburg uh, in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, uh, from a mixed use waterfront community to a residential community that we saw the massive gentrification and displacement. 2000 census, the Latino community comprised something like 60% of the community. 10 years later, by the 2010 census, the Latino community had dropped to less than 30%. Imagine how much more dramatic the displacement would have been had the markets not collapsed in the late 2000s. Displacement in the, in, in the age of climate change means that there won't be anything like social cohesion. That busybody up the block who knows everybody's business, who knows who's on a respirator, who's on dialysis, that's your first responder in the event of an extreme weather event. Puerto Rico became, for me, the poster child of climate injustice. Over 1,200 people have died, more than 3.5 million people with no water, no electricity, no food, no medical facilities, 
nothing. Because it became sort of the economic opportunity for U.S. corporations because of all the benefits, there are 20 super funds in Puerto Rico, highly hazardous sites. The contamination just spills, so the soil, the air, and the water is contaminated. In the United States sent in FEMA, and FEMA has relocated 300,000 people. And the feeling is that FEMA doesn't want to rebuild, it wants to relocate because they want to privatize the entire island. The United States was not only not providing assistance, but because of the Jones Act, was preventing other nations and other people from doing it either. In the midst of that, we collectively came up with this idea of a people-to-people -people just recovery. And so we created the Our Power PR campaign, a grassroots response from the United States, a frontline-led response from communities from Detroit, from Richmond, California, from Houston, from Brooklyn, New York. They specifically said they needed people to come in to help with the rebuilding. And they also wanted to engage in food sovereignty because before the storm hit, 85% of all the food came from outside of Puerto Rico and the other 15% was devastated by the storm. These people have all the solutions. They know exactly what they need from community to community. Uh, they know what the organizing mechanism needs to be so that they can come back from this disaster. For frontline communities and communities of color, we can't go back to injustice, back to racism, back to discrimination. We need to move forward to a very different kind of living and we need to be able to be ready for future extreme weather events. Two years before Sandy, New York City started um, reviewing and revising its coastal zone management plan, and we were stunned to see just how vulnerable all of these communities were to storm surges. Clusters of heavy chemical uses and polluting infrastructure, all potentially in the path of storm surges. And then we started realizing that this is not just an environmental justice fight, it's a climate justice fight. So for like two years before Sandy, we were organizing and successfully getting the city to, as they updated the coastal zone management plan, to insert climate protections for these industrial waterfront communities, right? In fact, the day that the city planning commission was supposed to have a hearing on how the waterfront new plan should, should, should work, they had to cancel that hearing because that was the day Sandy hit New York. The sensitive part is like on the, a slope, kind of. So all the water was rushing down straight into the water. There's a lot of car shops. When the water comes through and it's washing through these car shops, it's taking the chemicals with it. It's going to our water supply. The toxins are going into the air. Now on every block, we have a block captain that has um, the information to the people on the block. So say if there's an elderly person on the block, we all know that hey, this person lives on, in this building on the, f the fifth floor, and if something was to happen, they won't be able to get out because they're in a wheelchair. That was our response to Sandy, connecting with the people in the community and helping them, not just telling them what to do. What Sandy did was it became a wake-up call, which is why when 2014 rolled around and the People's Climate March, it's a reason why 400,000 people marched in the streets of New York. 10,000 people from Labor March, 50,000 students. And it was led by the communities that are most disproportionately impacted, 45,000 people. I think the main goal was to have the young people in the front. We're gonna be most affected and future generations are gonna be affected. I was in the front line. It was pretty amazing. I felt really empowered standing next to amazing people I hope to engage with in the future and that we have done that. To build that march, relationships had to be built for the first time between sectors that maybe were suspicious of each other, didn't always have the best track record. Um, you know, the conversations between anti-fracking, you know, the fractivists, and the unions were, were hard conversations and continue to be, right? The march was timed to coincide with the opening of the first UN Climate Leaders Summit since the collapse of the Copenhagen talks in 2009. And we told the mayor, you know, you have to take advantage and announce something big. And to his credit, the mayor announced the 80 by 50 goal, 80% reduction of the city's greenhouse gases by 2050. We could then drive a number of policy initiatives to reach that goal. The governor finally banned fracking, again, in the month or two after the People's Climate March. In our nurses' union of 38,000 members, when people said, well, what, what's this climate stuff? We, why are we doing this? 
Well, we had to study and we had to learn about um, this dangerous practice of hydraulic fracturing. We knew we had to not only educate our nurses, but to move them into action, working alongside patients and communities and environmental organizations, notably Food and Water Watch in New York, and that was the coalition whose strategic and tireless efforts were ultimately successful in banning fracking. Out of the People's Climate March also comes this relationship around divestment. New York Renews comes out of there. Climate Works for All comes out of there. We basically have all of these initiatives that come out of there that brings all of us together. New York Renews is a coalition of over 140 groups now across the state of New York and it's a huge diversity of types of groups. We have community-based groups, we have faith groups, labor unions, we have some solar installers coming together to fight for two key pieces of our platform. One is the Climate and Community Protection Act, which is a bill that would commit New York to plan for 100% renewable energy by 2050. And it includes a provision that within getting to that goal, 40% of state energy funds have to be invested in disadvantaged communities. And these are mostly communities of color, low income communities, and have been and will be most affected by climate change, which they contribute the least to. And then the second part of the platform is the Climate and Community Investment Act. How do we pay for that transition? It would put a modest fee on big polluters, basically as close to the source of where fossil fuels come into the New York economy as possible. A study out of the University of Massachusetts showed that this kind of fee could raise up to seven billion dollars per year for New York and create up to 150,000 new jobs per year in New York. We would take that money and reinvest it into building out renewable energy, infrastructure, supporting workers who are transitioning to new jobs out of the fossil fuel industry, supporting community-based projects, and also giving energy rebates back to New Yorkers. I think it's attractive because the dominant market narrative has been about polluter pays and it sounds progressive the polluter should pay but what happens when the polluter does pay they carry on polluting and if the charge on them is not particularly onerous then it's just an additional business cost which they will pass on to consumers and that means mostly working class people so you're putting a price on carbon to generate revenue to give back to people who've had an increase in their electricity bills, but you don't actually reduce emissions along the way. If you're not going to reduce emissions according to a scientific timetable, then there's no point doing it. Clearly, New York City is committed to the idea of accountability by fossil fuel companies for the damage they do, and a polluter fee statewide is a natural extension for that. Before I joined New Yorker News, I was a student at Columbia, and I was working on our fossil fuel divestment campaign there, trying to get Columbia to stop investing its $9 billion endowment in coal, oil, and gas. And we even had a seven-day sit-in in 2016. While they were sitting in, we did a sleep out where a couple hundred students slept on the steps in front of the building overnight. Columbia still has not committed to divest from the entire fossil fuel industry, but they committed to divest directly own stocks from the coal industry. There's been a huge citywide divest movement for years. There have been several trillions of dollars of assets that have committed to divest. The goal for when it comes to just transitions is to move Sunset Park away from a community that they just extract from. You can't tell people in the coal industry that they have to leave it and not give them something to take its place. We need to be able to create something to take its place. They need to put food on the table. And it's only people who come from privilege who can actually be so bold as to say we gotta shut it down. Those of us who come from the working class know what it's like to struggle. And so we have to be thoughtful and mindful about how do we create those opportunities where we're moving people from one economy to the other. The energy sector is the most important sector in terms of both emissions and alternatives. If we want to do this to scale and we want to do it union and we want to help communities, then it should be a public service. The private sector has been unable to deliver without big subsidies, which we end up paying for, to cover their profits and their borrowing costs. So public is less expensive. In the 1930s, mid-1930s, the Roosevelt administration launched the Rural Electrification Administration only 6% of rural America had electricity at that time, and by the mid-1950s it was 96-97%, all done publicly. One of the things that we've been doing is identifying ways of building up potential solar arrays that could be community co-owned. There are ways that we can uh, capture those revenues and reapply the economic de development 
opportunities that can accrue from those revenues, keeping that in the community. We need to resist the designs of large energy companies for profit, particularly in fossil fuels. We need to reclaim what was once public that was privatized back to the public, but those public entities need to be restructured in a way that they can be truly democratic. We need to own the transition, the small transitions and the large transitions. We provide a youth summit every year in which we invite a lot of youth across the United States as well as New York to come and learn about climate change and environmental justice. It's like a share of information, like we share strategies and we talk to each other, we talk about the work we've done, where we plan on going and build connections. You don't have to be 18 or older to get involved. I started when I was 13. Learn about what you want to fight against and make sure you make connections with people who are fighting against the same thing. Bring together your friends, your family, tell them what's happening and maybe they have similar experiences. I'm a young Puerto Rican woman. So Puerto Rican strike one, woman strike two, young strike three. You need to find a place like Uprose that supports you and takes everything that they say is your downfall and turns it into your power.